Hi, welcome to Greenville Health System, Department of OBGYN, Pearlcast Library. I'm Dr. Donald Wiper. I'm a gynecologic oncologist. And today we're going to spend a few minutes talking about endometrial hyperplasia and carcinoma. Hyperplasia is a word that simply means too much growth, which in some cases can lead to a cancer. The easiest way to understand uh, this spectrum of disorders is to think about them in two big groups. Type 1 and Type 2. Now when I'm talking about these two, I'm talking about two ways we view cancers of the endometrium. To put this in perspective, and as discussed in a prior pearl cast, there are multiple cancers that can arise in the uterus. There are those that arise inside the myometrium, and we call those lyomyosarcoma. There are those that can arise from within the endometrial lining itself, uh, and there are multiple of those. There are actually two cell types inside of the uh, endometrium. There's stroma, connective tissue, mesenchymal tissue, all categorized as stroma, and then glands or endometrial glands. You can have a cancer of one of these or both. When you have a malignancy of the stroma, that's an endometrial stromal sarcoma, and those come low grade and high grade. These are not the topic for today. In addition, you can have cancers of just the glands, and that's what we call endometrial cancer. And, it, and the precancerous lesion of this we call endometrial hyperplasia. That will be the topic for today. In addition, you can have a malignancy where both of these are uh, have undergone neoplastic and malignant transformation, and we call that a carcinosarcoma, also known historically as a triple MT. That's three M's and a T, which stands for a malignant mixed malarian tumor. We're going to focus on this and uh, the precancerous uh, lesion we call hyperplasia. Prior to getting into that, uh, we need to understand that whether it's hyperplasia or cancer, the presenting symptoms are fairly typical. If you're a premenopausal woman, then you typically will have some sort of uh, uh, abnormal uh, bleeding pattern. Perhaps you had normal menses and now you have intermenstrual spotting or bleeding or new onset heavy bleeding or menorrhagia. In the postmenopausal uh, patient, virtually all women that develop either hyperplasia or cancer develop postmenopausal bleeding. Typically painless, uh, but um, um, postmenopausal bleeding uh, would be a hallmark of those uh, women uh, after menopause. The best way to understand um, uh, this uh, spectrum of disorders, uh, as mentioned, is to think about it in terms of type 1 and type 2. Endometrial cancer, type 1, type 2. Type 1 is all about too much estrogen. Type 2 has nothing to do with estrogen. Type 2 has everything to do with um, loss of growth control, characterized by such things as p53 uh, mutations. These typically occur in postmenopausal women, and they can arise and typically do arise in a background of an atrophic endometrium. And we'll get into that a little bit more in a minute. On the type 1 cancers, which are all characterized by too much estrogen, these can occur in premenopausal women or postmenopausal women. The key thing is to understand where the sources of estrogen are coming from uh, in the type 1 uh, cancers and precancers, as opposed to type 2, which happen uh, spontaneously. So let's first talk about uh, the type 1 cancers and their precancerous lesions, also known as hyperplasia. I said 
The problem is too much estrogen, so the question is where is the source of that estrogen? And like most things, that source can be either exogenous or endogenous. The exogenous sources can be from your doctor, perhaps giving you unopposed estrogen replacement. This occurs sometimes in the postmenopausal women who try taking the progesterone but can't tolerate it and keep taking the progesterone without, uh, or keep taking the estrogen without the progesterone. We would call this an iatrogenic source. The other sources of exogenous estrogens can be soy products, uh, have phytoestrogens and have uh, stimulatory effects on the endometrium. Shifting gears to the endogenous sources of estrogen, the number one culprit are fat cells. Fat cells have the ability through aromatase to take an adrenal source of androstene diem and convert it into estrone, which is the weakest but most abundant of the circulating estrogens. When women have excess weight uh, characterized by uh, fatty deposition, this process produ can produce lots of excess estrogen in the body. The other sources of endogenous estrogen can be the relative imbalance of estrogen progesterone in premenopausal women associated with PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome. PCOS deserves a minute of discussion. PCOS is characterized by insulin resistance, classic features on the ovary of multicystic change, and these classic features are typically called polycystic ovaries, and then some element of oligoovulation, or infrequent ovulatory function. This is critical because premenopausal women that develop either endometrial hyperplasia, which is simply too much growth of the endometrium, or premenopausal malignancies almost universally have some degree of PCOS that leads to these triad of symptoms. And in particular, oligoovulation is the issue hormonally that leads to hyperplastic growth. In the typical menstrual cycle, you see a well-ordered process with estrogen, progesterone, day 1, day 28, the orderly peaks of LH and FSH. Somewhere around day 14, there's been a recruitment of a dominant follicle, which eventually leads to ovulation of the selected egg. And that space that's left behind, we call the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum's job is to make lots of progesterone to support an early pregnancy. When women don't ovulate, they don't have a functional corpus luteum, and they don't have a source of estrogen. So effectively, when they do recruit follicles every month to lead up to a potential ovulation, they have lots of circulating estrogen, but not the counterbalancing progesterone. This source of estrogen leads to increased stimulation and growth of the endometrium. And we call that hyperplasia. The hyperplasia of the uterus, looking at this uterus in side view, is the end result of too much estrogen in the body and so there's a field effect, meaning covering the whole thing, of the endometrium. And so you typically would develop widespread endometrial growth and hyperplasia. These patients eventually will have some sort of menstrual abnormality, uh, which uh, will lead to a biopsy. 
and an office biopsy is quite effective because as you can see it doesn't really matter where the tip of the aspiration catheter is, you're likely to get the same information no matter where you are.